welcome to the course disaster recovery and build back better my name is ram satish i'm an assistant professor department of architecture and planning indian institute of technology roorkee today i'm going to discuss about a heritage component how it is subjected to risk and how one can analyze from a very multi disciplinary perspective and also how the conservation plan works along with the risk management plan so this is about uh, rock shelters at risk and uh, in the whole world if you look at the ancient man's shelter the very uh, basic form of shelter is the caves you know the cave dwellings and the uh, rock shelters and different parts of the world still carry some evidences that how the earlier man have lived and there are some images of their paintings there have been some images of their nomadic or pastoral life or hunting life you know so uh, these are all some learnings of today's how the today's generation can also learn from our histor historical records and the anthropological aspect of human life so when you see at this image so i am not talking about as an historian i am not talking about as an architect i am talking from a risk perspective how this heritage component subjected to risk and uh, how one can look at from a multidisciplinary perspective so when you look at this image obviously one can notice that there has been some kind of liquid lava or something which has been flown around this region and it has got settled down and that is how uh, from the google earth map you can see that the whole gradients and the slopes and the aspects which are formed by the way it has been cooled down and then uh, you can see some cliff kind of environment here and a valley sort of thing if you go a little closer the same cliffs it looks like this where there's a mountains around it a very plateau sort of mountains and uh, if you go further closer and this is what we can see the pital kora caves this is in the western ghats in the satamala range of the western ghats in uh, maharashtra state of india and uh, in fact i want to give a credit of two important people like this is uh, most of the information this has been from the source of prabhakar nanda gopal that time he was a superintending archaeologist in the archaeological survey of india and his work has been uh, he's been working on this projects and also uh, desh pandey's work so this i have been able to procure from shivi joshi who was my student earlier in sp bopal so many of the photographs and many of uh, the details which i'm learning from their work dr nanda gopal's work and uh, what you can see is the cave dweller settlements and in fact Uh, this was also a kind of excavation site and one where people realized that there has been a human settlement here and uh, in this you can find uh, many nomadic uh, tribes you know roaming, roaming around and uh, one is it is also just not only in the near proximity but they do travel if you look at their networks the trade networks it goes back to Uh, Mahishmati, it goes back to Ujjayin, Ujjayin, it goes back to Bhimbetka in Madhya Pradesh, you know, so Ellora, Ajanta, so like that. There's been a, a network how people have travelled and migrated and settled in different parts of uh, central and the western part of uh, India, and uh, also. their expansion in the port cities like you know on the western side of the port cities how they have settled down and you can see some similarities of how these cave dwellings have some similarities in the african continent as well as in the south american continent there some kind of similar depictions of how man has lived so this is the layout of uh, a buddhist site which is a pital kora caves which is in the district of aurangabad now initially this uh these sites goes back to almost pre 250 bc which is almost to the 3rd century uh, bc as well and they are not done if you look at there are about uh, 13 caves which has been 
discovered in the excavation process. And uh, some of them have been discovered much later and some were discovered uh, in the beginning. And if you look at the phase wise and what you are able to see here is uh, uh, the, the cave numbers which has been written on 1 and uh, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 9 and 6a and on the bottom side you have 10, 11 and 12 and 13. There is also they are not the same form, they are not of the same alignment. Like you can see from number 3 which is a kind of chai cha sort of thing and uh, here again in 13 as well you can see a kind of uh, chai chas and viharas of a Buddhist uh, style and whereas where we talk about number 1 which is of uh, a very rudimentary stage of a cave which is about dates back to pre 250 BC and then the phase 2 which talks about the 1C and 2 and 3 which is a smaller one and the third one is a kind of chai cha which is uh, an elongated corridor. So that is again goes back to 250 BC. Whereas number 4 which is about a huge uh, square base which is between 250 to 200 BC. Whereas in 7 which has a similar which has again a smaller component, smaller compartments around it and that is uh, dating back to phase 4 which is about uh, 200 to 180 BC. And similarly you have uh, number 6 and 2A they are all again dating back to 180 to 160 BC and if you come like that number 11 and 12 where you can see uh, on the bottom side on the, the other side of the caves you can see that they are dates back to uh, 1st century BC and 1st century AD as well uh, and number 8, 9 this is also again goes back to um, 13 which is uh, more refined stage in uh, the second century AD. So this is how it took almost about from pre 250 BC onwards till the second century AD. So that is a kind of timeline of how these cave dwellings have been developed in this region in the Satamala range of uh, Western Ghats in Maharashtra. Now how do they able to figure out this process you know that there have been evidences there's been some iconographists who have studied how their paintings were done, how the symbolic representations on their pillars, who have donated it, when it was donated. So there's been a, a linguistic understanding, there's been an artistic understanding in it and you know the style representation, interpretation of it. Now for example, when we talk about how they have identified on the right hand side in the photograph you can see some small text uh, which has been um, uh, written in uh, either Pali or uh, and this is saying that the pillar is the donation of Mitadeva which is a Mitra Deva of the Gadika family a resident of Pratithana which is Pratistana the modern Python. So in fact this is these inscriptions is telling actually about who is the family who have donated the to the construction of the pillar? So, which means, and from where they belong to? So, all this process uh, has been become a very rich evidence to know that uh, what kind of families used to live around, how they are connected, what kind of time they were talking about, and like that. If you look at it, the phases uh, we find nearly five phases of inscriptional records at Pitalkhora. One is the Mitadeva and Sangakasha. Raja Vajesha family, Dhenuka Katakam and uh, uh, Bhutarakita and whereas phase 4 it talks about Nun and Khanhadasa and phase 5 Avesena. So this is how some of the evidences and similar to this you can see that uh, this is also donated by the Sangaka both the residents of Patithana and the whole and if you look at the panoramic view of the whole caves, what you can see is the small, small caves which are actually uh, located in a very linear uh, pattern and has been embedded under this mountain, big mound which has been covered. And there are also some iconographic aspects of science and symbolic aspects of it where you can find some sculpture as well. where in the time elephant is referred to the conception 
bull is referred to nativity, horse is referred to great departure, lion is referred to sakya and simha, you know, so like that there are some different meanings associated to these symbolic expressions. In the Buddhism, one of the important phase we talk about the Mahayana phase of Buddhism at Pitalkura. It is also the paintings which also depict with the time. Like if you see the left hand side one, which actually both of them, they are talking about the paintings of the Mahayana phase were drawn where the caves were occupied by the followers of the Mahana sect. But you can see the time different, the style of Buddha, both of them are talking about the Buddhas where it is the, the hairstyle has been different and there's artistic style is also very different. In, in fact, uh, at some point of the time, people also used to uh, make a, this a kind of Pitalkora style of hairstyle. You know, these are all some representative skills which has been developed through time. Now, this is a brief about the caves and their historic aspect like the Buddhist uh, sex and how they have been represented. But then I will also touch upon the, the geotechnical aspects of it, the geomorphological aspects of it. Now in Pitalkora we actually notice a very thick layer of tachalic basalt at the lower proximity of the hill which have restricted the scope of excavation as per projected plans because you know this is about this basalt which actually sometimes it becomes a very soft material when it keeps making an excavation it breaks into the pieces you know that's how there is a chance that the evidence will also be losing we'll be losing some evidence like now what you see here is a kind of lava where we talk about the R which is the basaltic lava which is characterized by a rough or a rubbly surface and uh, these lava blocks also we actually extract the clinker from this kind of uh, rough and rubbly surface lava. This is called A. Ah. This is a very smooth surface which is unbroken lava. It's also a basaltic lava that has a very smooth billowy undulating or a ropey surface and this is called Pahoy. Pahoy and uh, this is a Hawaiian meaning which is called smooth and unbroken lava. It just floats in a very smooth uh, liquid like you know when the mercury starts uh, flowing down. When these kind of uh, molten lava gets cooled up uh, that is where it develops the structural forms. Whether structural joints are developed and some hollow spaces are also developed and this is where the hollow spaces becomes eventually man have made his shelters. Now what we can see is the layers of the horizontal layers of one over the another. So these layers also talks about these beds which are talking about. So a set of lava have come down and gradually another set of flower and the, by the time it cools down the another set came another set came so this is how this horizontal layer started developing one over the another and this tachylitic basalt it is not a conducive rock for cave excavation as its chemical properties react sharply with moisture and disintegrate into pieces the moment you are making an excavation process it gradually breaks into small small wedge shaped pieces you know that is one of the important uh, aspect in the excavation challenge as an excavation challenge especially with this kind of material. There is another form of uh, structure where we talk about the ropey structure. So that is where there is again a pahoi sort of thing which actually twi twists into a kind of ropey format and you can see also as time passes on the periodical, uh, periodical weathering takes place because this layers on the top layers keeps coming like a chip by chip and uh, this is again in a periodical manner. This is called periodical weathering. And uh, on the left hand side you see an example of the how the whole the rock formation and because of the weathering aspect how it chips down. On the right hand side what you see is a kind of bowl beds which is actually look at the time intervals of how these successive lava flows have been trapped uh, in the Deccan trap, you know. And as the time passed on, obviously there's been some water bodies, small waterfalls or they keep channeling it as per the, the slope and the gradient which has been a natural form. 
but then it has been there for ages and until people have discovered no one have realized it and uh, it's been there since many decades now things are the water is following down the seepage has started it in the caves and this is one aspect now what they did was the geo uh, the archaeologist team they have actually mapped down they have actually documented the whole set of caves including the analysis of the cracks this is where they talk about the geological mapping of the ceiling of the caves and this is one of the chaicha where they have documented where are the cracks coming into it what are the categories they classified the categories of the risk so uh, depending on the nature of the crack and from the stable to the most uh, instable level so that is how they left crack 1 category 1 2 3 4 5 and that is where they classified and categorized this risk aspects and similarly um, uh, this is again they again categorize with what are the different aspects of the risk one is the slightly weather uh, weathered uh, vesicular basalt and also uh, water seepage zones which are more of this dotted aspects of it and the uh, where the edge of the broken ceiling you know or the roof and this is where uh, they try to again classify all these aspects and also uh, where the cracks are also appearing continuously not only in a horizontal in the ceiling level but in, throughout the cave structure how this uh, vertical cracks are also coming up and after having a, this i showed you only a small a set of uh, analysis of how one have able to document all these caves and how they will be able to map down from a spatial point of it and analyze what are the root causes for it where are the material aspects into it where are the water seepage issues where are the ceiling has been broken down or if there's a pillars have been broken down whether the floor aspect which has been chipping out because of weathering aspects or during rainy season what kind of impacts it is having so all these documentations have been done so but then when you look at um, the set of activities which has been taken as a part of the conservation plan from 1954 to 2008 you see a, a huge span of time but then a very limited work what we can see but then one has to understand it is not a regular building project it is a conservation project so it normally takes time because even analyzing to make a small scaffolding how to do it is also a big task you know because you might destroy the evidence like in 1954 55 this has been completely blocked up with the big boulders and debris they have started clearing it and then there already some fallen and collapsed parts of rock lying in front were removed and the area has been leveled up and in 55 56 so has been very little known group of caves were affected by the construction of steps to the caves from hill top and removal of huge boulders fallen from the ceiling and other debris in the vihara adjoining the main chaicha so in 57 and 58 clearance in front of the chaicha and vihara caves reveal some unique features and sculptures that is where i showed you the lion and the bull the horses and 58 59 there's again cave 4 revealed two more elephant uh, caryatids and uh, the, like that one by one they started uh, discovering and they started and again in 1959 60 by this time it's almost 6 years to even taking the debris from the hillside opposite cave 1 to 4 you know that is how it's a 6 year project only just to clear the debris and whereas in 60 61 a rock cut cistern was cleared of debris for the storage of water and the excavation of rock cut drain on the top of the cave was started the work is so in that way they started the cistern as well as the water storage and 1995 this is where they started about a mile steel foot bridge to for the because the tourists start pumping down and in order to channel them without destroying the evidence that is where they try to keep some kind of access whereas they also in 2001 onwards the deposit work is awarded to G- gsi geological survey of india towards the cost of geological and geotechnical and geophysical and geo environmental studies of the pitalkora caves and the surroundings whereas here it's not only that the how a set of activities are related to there's a different dimension of technicality comes into it 
Now, it is not a story of a conservation architect, it is not only a task, but how his analysis works with the geotechnical and the geo-environmental studies also collaborate in it because they becomes the base now in order to understand the impact aspects of this kind of case or the risk aspect. Now, inside the caves, following all these analysis, what kind of modifications has been done? So now you can see that uh, they have started looking at how the edges of the roof and the structure of the vertical aspect and the roof aspect are merging. That is where a lot of damage have occurred and there might be a chance that it might collapse at any time. So that is where they started giving some kind of support system at the edges so that there is a uh, you know the, the balance of the structure as well. Also what you can see here is whatever the columns they already have and now retrofitting them and giving a kind of support to the ceiling as well. So now you can see the um, scaffolding process because in the scaffolding process is a very important task because you don't need to like in a normal building project you hit the wall, you put you puncture it and then you try to keep a support system. But here in conservation project it doesn't work like that. You have to because each and every evidence is much more uh, important, significant and it is very critical to understand that. So this is how the restoration process has been done. And on the flooring part, you know, because there's been sometimes it has been chipped out, so that is where they start making some kind of flooring restoration has been done. And similarly, they also given some support systems where there's been cracks and there's a possibility that this, this may not bear the load after some time. So that is where they started giving some kind of a huge rubble masonry wall, not masonry, it's a kind of dry stone uh, wall, uh, which they have able to sub give a little support on that. So without giving any additional material or render to it, but just keeping as a stone wall. Also the paintings are most important elements, that is where they keep subject to the risk. So how to restore these paintings, that is one of the biggest challenge. And uh, that is where you have to work out with the people from chemistry, with people from archaeologists, because you need to see that there is a material scientist could also be involved in it, how we can actually protect them is very important. Now, what you can see is a small canal, but after having a thorough understanding of the topographic aspects and after having a understanding of where the water seepages are coming, they understood the root cause of the water is not just not in the cave, it is somewhere beyond the mountain. So then they started making a kind of channel, you know, how to uh, divert this water so that at least it can protect the water seepage in the caves. So this is, uh, it could be a very small intervention, but then a thorough analysis has to be done in order to protect these heritage structures. In fact, um, one of the scholar who actually worked on this particular structure is M. N. Deshpande, and uh, where there's been many names of this Pitalkora, Pitalkoreya, Chileni, Kora, so ravine, a gorge or a glen, and Sinclair Levy, which is a brazen glen, Palkora, which is a ficus religiosa, which is a bodhi tree which is reflected the Buddhism and you know that is how a lot of uh, uh, disciplines come together and they work on this kind of assessment of the risk as well, also the conservation but how you manage it is also an important aspect. I hope uh, this helps you. Thank you very much.